we talk about political independence, and it's not so much, I think, in the Green Party, but in the broader progressive circles of politics, they tend to regard political independence as a tactic, not a first principle. It's contingent on certain circumstances. So sometimes they'll support a progressive Democrats. Sometimes they'll do a, progress, a protest vote for a Green or other alternative candidate. And I think what we got to be telling people is this is a first principle, not a contingent tactic to advance progressive values. And this has actually been socialist politics 101 since 1848. It's been a principle on the left, a lesson learned. Because in 1848, when those democratic revolutions, kind of like the Arab Spring today, was sweeping across Europe, it was a coalition of the rising working class and the rising capitalist class against the landed aristocracy for more democratic political structures so that the aristocracy didn't rule. But what the workers found out is the capitalists really didn't want them to have the vote. And once they got the aristocracy out of the way, the capitalists wanted power for themselves and sold the workers down the river. And that was the big lesson that the left took away from 1848. And it became a uh, principle for left politics. The uh, workers were more numerous. They could outvote the capitalists, and the capitalists saw that. And so, you know, expanding the franchise became a whole struggle throughout that period. And it was the socialist left that was pushing that. And for them, the point was to form their own party to speak for themselves because they couldn't rely on the capitalists to speak for them. And that was how they would put their program forward and reach a broader public. And so that's an old lesson that we seem to have lost. And I'll tell you in a minute where I think we lost it. But if you follow independent politics in this country, the next expression of that, and it was actually done by a lot of the veterans, they, they called them the 48ers, the Red 48ers, who were exiled from Europe, came to the United States, were involved in the founding of the Liberty Party and Free Soil and then Republican parties. And then as Reconstruction fell apart and the country moved to the right, the formation of the Greenback Labor Party in uh, 1880. There had been a precursor earlier, but there was a whole series of populist parties culminating in the People's Party. And it was always a fight then for political independence because at that time you had the two-party system. In the South it was the Democrats, in the North it was the Republicans. And as these third-party insurgencies came up, the major parties, and fusion was a general practice. That's where you cross endorse and you can be on the ballot line of more than one party or your label will be more than one party, depending on how the ballot was done in your state. Actually, back then, they had tickets that you stuffed in the ballot. The state didn't print the ballot. So, you know, they would print fusion tickets where the candidate would have both labels on it. Uh, what was tending to happen was a fight between those that said the third party insurgency should speak for itself and put its own forward program own program forward and opportunists coming from a major party. In the South it would have been the Republicans that were the minor party in the South and they wanted to ally with the populist movement. And in the North it was Democrats, I mean it was, yeah, in the North it was Democrats who tended to be in the minority, also in the Midwest and West who tried to run fusion candidacies with the uh, populist parties, which had various names until it settled on People's Party that we're most familiar with. And what tended to happen was a lot of those fusion candidates got elected, but the populists found that they were really a Democrat or a Republican. It wasn't the populist. They used the populist. And so they began to, you know, relearn that lesson that we have to run our own candidates, speak for ourselves, and not rely on uh, alliances with parties that represent other interests and other classes. And uh, what happened to the People's Party was in 1896, they succumbed to fusion at the presidential level. William Jennings Bryan, who really wasn't a populist in the sense that populism had a whole program worked out for monetary reform and uh, you know the uh, sub-treasury system that really would have financed the agrarians and also had a labor platform. All William Jennings Bryan was talking about was free silver, which was a very small part of the whole populist program. And he was pushed by the silver mining interests, the Hearst newspapers. It was a capitalist faction against the other faction, which was Mark Hanna and Jay Gould, who really, you know, brought corporate financing of politics into American politics in a big way that year. But the populists died in that election and uh, really never recovered. Now the populists who were more left-wing, some of them became, 
you know, joined the Ku Klux Klan, Tom Watson, you know, he, he, he'd been anti-racist, but being a politician in Georgia ended up, you know, running as a racist to get elected and was, you know, a real sad story going into the 20th century. But a lot of the populists went in with the labor movement and the socialists, Eugene Debs, and they were very clear. The Socialist Party was very clear from 1900 until really 1930s about political independence for the left. Then it wasn't even a debate. You know, the Socialist Party was going to run its own candidates. And they were very successful. They elected people to scores of cities as mayors, councils, uh, state legislatures, even Congress. Uh, Congress wouldn't seat them during World War I at one point for two terms in a row. The guy from Milwaukee, uh, that was Berger, I believe. But the city of Milwaukee was run by socialists from the teens right up into the 1950s. And uh, side note here is, you know, the right and the Democrats are talking about fiscal responsibility. What the socialists did was tax the rich up front instead of borrowing from them. And if you look at the uh, indebtedness and the problems with uh, municipal bankruptcies in the 30s, the socialists ran sur budget surpluses by progressive taxation and never had the fiscal problems that uh, the administrations run by the other parties, which tended to be dominated by the banking and real estate interests. And, and putting the city into debt was a way of financing their profits. So uh, they, they were very successful by running on their own platform. And even after the Socialist Party split, you know, the Russian Revolution and the Communists split off a couple of Communist parties, and there was a lot of controversy. And the Socialist Party, and plus the state came down hard on them. They uh, rounded up and exiled a bunch of the Socialist leaders because they had been immigrants from Europe and uh, made it a very difficult climate. Eugene Debs ran for president from prison, got almost a million votes in 1920. In fact, the, one of the buttons said, vote for prisoner number, whatever his number was. And uh, so, you know, there was a very strong movement they built up. And even though they couldn't run as socialists in 24, they, they endorsed the La Follette presidency, which was a one-time insurgency. La Follette wasn't really trying to build a third party. He was a progressive Republican. Back then, you know, the Republicans were to the left of the, most of the Democrats on a lot of questions. You know, this debt ceiling, ironically, was progressive Republicans put it on as a limit for Wilson when he went into World War I, so he wouldn't you know, spend too much on the war and get us in debt. Anyway, that, that election got uh, La Follette uh, 16 million votes. I think it was 6% of the, yeah, it was 16 million and maybe it was 16%. I'm getting confused. Anyway, it was the biggest left, I may be confusing it with uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Bull Moose Progressive. Anyway, it was the biggest left vote that we've ever gotten, you know, in, as a third party in, uh, in U.S. history. So that indicated that this movement was still there, and, and for the left, political independence was a principle. And that continued with efforts to form a farmer labor party or a progressive party, which by the 30s had control of uh, Wisconsin, the progressive party, and Minnesota, the farmer labor party. And going into the 1936 election, Roosevelt, or the Democratic National Committee, polled and found that Huey Long could beat Roosevelt. Now, Huey Long was actually going to support Floyd Olson, the former labor candidate from Minnesota. And there was a, so there was a strong third-party insurgency along with the, the movement uh, to form industrial unions and the sit-down strikes that really shook up the country in 1934 and 35. And then uh, Long, who had his problems, I think, from a progressive point of view, but was willing to support Olson, was assassinated. Olson got stomach cancer and died. So the third party movement was something called the Union Party, and it was more a right-wing populist, you know, economically progressive but socially reactionary thing. They got 2% of the vote. But what I'm saying is that third party insurgency, I think, is part of the reason why, along with the direct action of the labor movement, there was a second New Deal where we got the National Labor Relations Board, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the Social Security Act. Um, but then the left made a big mistake. They got into the popular front, which was what the communists were pushing. And they pushed it in 36. They ran their own candidate, but they were basically saying, vote for Roosevelt. And the idea there was to stop the right, we got to unite with the center, which meant the corporate liberals, the, the Democratic Party, the New Deal coalition. And the result of that, I would argue, is that the left disappeared. It stopped speaking for itself. It's tried speaking through corporate candidates and wasn't put in its own argument, lost its voice, lost its presence, lost its very identity as an opposition. 
And that politics, I think, is still with us in the progressive side of U.S. politics to this day. I mean, take United for Peace and Justice in 2004, the main peace group. And uh, they took a conscious strategy, their leadership, which was, you know, the prominent, dominant group in the peace movement, to campaign against the Bush agenda. That was the big demonstration in New York City, and that was the unifying slogan, rather than stop the war. And that was basically to allow Kerry to win. They were supporting Kerry in a, in a backhanded way, but nonetheless, that was the message. And of course, Kerry wanted a 40,000 troop surge. Bush only ended up with 30,000. You know, he was a pro-war candidate, but the peace movement was supporting him as the lesser evil. And that, you know, I think demoralized and helped, it helps explain why the peace movement's been so weak. Because people said, you know, what are we, what are we advocating here, peace or Democrats? And uh, so, and I think all of us have encountered this kind of uh, mentality. We've seen it, uh, you know, in, in our experience as Greens, um, in recent elections, but I, I want to say that I think where the Greens come from is beginning in the new left, both black liberation and anti-war movements, there were beginning to be the resurgence of independent politics. It was first expressed in the black formations, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the Alabama National Democratic Party, and out of that the Freedom Now Party, which was a you know idea for a black party that would uh, speak for black interests because they felt the Democrats, as Malcolm X said, show me a Democrat and I'll show you a Dixiecrat. And that was in response to 64. That's how he introduced Fannie Lou Hamer in Harlem to uh, his new organization, uh, the Organization of African American Unity, explaining what happened in 1964 because it wasn't uh, George Wallace and uh, Lester Maddox and Bilbo and those Democrats that told the Freedom Democrats that they wouldn't get seated and the segregationists would and that the Freedom Democrats could have two honorary seats. Johnson sent Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale to deliver the message to the Freedom Democrats. And that's what uh, I think Malcolm X was talking about. And then I look at the election in 2000 and I wonder if things haven't really changed because it was Lieberman <laughs> that said, uh, we're not going to make a racial issue of the racial profiling to suppress the black vote in Florida. And, you know, they didn't fight it. They rolled over for the Republicans and let the, you know, the racism in that ele uh, vote suppression stand and let Bush go to office without a fight. And then they blamed us, the Greens, Ralph Nader. You know, it was all Ralph's fault. You know, so that's, that's where that mentality leads. Um, so the next step, this is like 1964. By 68, there were independent socialists and who were in the peace movement and the Black Panther Party in California formed the Peace and Freedom Party. They tried to go national at first. There was a new politics convention where the dream ticket would have been uh, Martin Luther King and Dr. Benjamin Spock, but that blew apart for a lot of reasons that maybe we can go into if you ask me a question about it. Uh, but they did come together with Peace and Freedom, and Peace and Freedom is the first party to have not just a conservation plank, but an ecology plank. And so you begin to see the environmental movement get into independent politics with that movement. And that evolved in, at a low level with the People's Party, which did run Spock in 72, and again in 76 as a vice presidential candidate. That was a coalition of state parties that grew out of that insurgency in 68, Peace and Freedom in California, to Liberty Union in Vermont. There was the Common Good Party over here in Ithaca, New York, started by Paul Glover, who those of you in the Green Movement know him for Ithaca dollars and starting the Ithaca Green Party, and he's now down in Philadelphia. He started a uh, health cooperative, you know, hardcore green. He, well, he was in the People's Party. A lot of us were come from peace and freedom through People's. Next iteration was the Citizens Party, Barry Commoner, which was more a top-down effort that had some liberal money behind it. Um, but a lot of the people were disillusioned as a result of that. Acorn, for example, was involved in that early and, you know, were disappointed with the results and went into the Democratic Party as a result. Um, but Petra Kelly called the Citizens Party the U.S. Green Party, probably prematurely, but, you know, that's when the Greens in Germany were coming up. And in 83, when they got into the parliament, a lot of us came together as Greens. And, you know, that has been the main expression of independent politics since then. And, you know, our independence really wasn't an issue until after that 2000 situation. And then there was a real backlash. It really started before Florida even happened. 
because the Democrats realized that Ralph Nader was still above 5% after Labor Day in the polls. And so they put Jesse Jackson and Gloria Steinem out on the road and started, you know, basically taking down Nader, you know, on a personal level. And, and I don't know how much has been written up. I think it's covered in one of Ralph's books to some extent. But the reality is the Democrats came to Nader and said, look, if you drop out now, we'll make sure all your groups are funded. You'll be set. If you don't drop out, we're going to destroy you, not just your groups, but you personally, and trash your personality. And then we saw that happen post-election. And it, it, it penetrated the Green Party. We have to admit that. That's when we began coming up with strategies like safe states, where we run uh, competitively and all out in states where the result is pretty much known, the safe states, where the Republicans or Democrats were going to win it. But if it's competitive, we kind of let, in this case, Kerry win. Um, which what that does is, you know, weaken our whole message because if we're not serious about our own politics, who else is going to be serious about it? Um, and, you know, one of the things that came out, and this actually started in 2000, remember uh, the vote swapping proposal? That was Steve Cobble, who had been a Democrat from the McGovern campaign but was a senior advisor to Nader, and he came up with this idea that as 2000 was getting close and, the, you know, it was a close election and they're worried about Nader, quote unquote, spoiling it, Cobble came up with the idea that uh, find a friend in a safe state and then they can vote for Nader and then your battleground state, you can vote for Kerry. So you're like giving your vote to somebody else in another state. Well, Nader rejected that, but Cobble then gave it to uh, Molly Ivins, who put it in a national column. And some people thought that was a strategy. In fact, if you go to Michael Moore's book, Stupid White Men, you read the last chapter, it makes you think he's a stupid white man because what he did was basically apologize for ever supporting Nader and saying at the last minute he went down to Florida and tried to save the day and Nader had promised not to campaign in the battleground states and he was focusing on the battleground states. It's a lot of nonsense. It was more explaining, you know, his politics than, than what the Greens were doing. But that's the climate we found ourselves in after 2000 because we actually were in a position to affect the outcome. And it, you know, it got into our movement, and I think we hesitated for a while. Um, I don't know if uh, coming out of 2000, too many people still advocate safe states, but within the broader progressive movement, there are groups that talk about, you know, support the Greens here, but the progressive Democrats there, and, and that should be our strategy. And I'm going to say why I think that's very problematic in a minute, but I, I think another way to think about this uh, is just look at how we fit into the Greens internationally. Because the Greens popped up at a time when the Labor and Social Democratic parties had really adapted to the system. And they don't have corporate financing the campaigns, but they have capitalists that control the economy and can veto public policies they don't like. You know, look at Mitterrand coming into France with a program of nationalizing the banks and some industries and so forth. And the French capitalists said, you do that, we're leaving. And they began to leave. And then he, you know, he backed off the program. In other words, private capital has a veto over public policy. And the so-called socialist parties in Europe began to accept that. So rather than advocating socialism, they became advocates of social insurance, the welfare state, a managed capitalism. They adapted to corporate liberalism. And that was partly why the Greens rose up in response, because they weren't dealing with uh, those issues, as well as a whole set of others. And as time went on, it became neoliberalism became the dominant approach of the capitalists. That meant deregulation, cutting back on the welfare state. The response now in Europe, look who's leading the austerity programs. It's the socialist parties in Greece, France, the Labour Party in Britain. And, you know, and I think that's what the Democratic Party is doing now. They, they're bringing in Obama to do what the Republicans couldn't get away with. Just like Nixon could go to China, Obama can do the Hoover policy. In fact, Paul Krugman called uh, Obama last week the second coming of Herbert Hoover. I mean, this debt ceiling is, you know, put us going to put us in a depression and not deal with the crisis of jobs and foreclosures. So that's the 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 political economy of the politics that they were dealing with in Europe. Plus, the other thing that was really needed was that in adapting to the welfare and warfare state, because there was the NATO, the Cold War divide, and the Socialist parties had taken one side, the Communist parties had taken the other side, rather than standing for peace and dealing with other issues that had become critical. The environment, racism, feminism, gay rights. 
and of course the nuclear issue. So you know the Greens felt a need to to form a new left, uh, you know, a new expression, so those issues could be brought forward in a program, which the old left had neglected because they'd adapted to the system. And so I think you know that's another uh, way of looking at the importance of independent politics for our movement instead of trying to work in coalition with the power structure that's actually opposed to what we're trying to do. Um, so what I'm saying is if, if we go in and endorse progressive Democrats, we're basically undermining our own politics. This, this popular front coalition from the 30s is where it comes from, although it's not called that anymore. And what we do is we lose our voice because we're trying to speak through people like John Kerry, the peace movement, trying to speak through John Kerry when he wants to escalate 40,000 troops in Iraq. That's what the broad progressive movement did in 2004. Um, and so a left analysis of what's going on or a green analysis of what's going on in our program disappears as an opposition and an alternative. And you know we're, we're, we're reduced to lobbying our own candidates, our progressive democratic candidates, to say what we want and do what we want and we don't have any leverage. I mean, look at the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Who does Obama get mad at? Not the Republicans. He's trying to do bipartisan everything. And then he says, you know, shut up. You're bothering me. You know, why are you giving me such a hard time to the progressives in the Congress? It's like the, the, he's treating them as their biggest enemy. And that's how we get treated if we go into that coalition, because the Democratic Party coalition is a coalition. They're, the base is very progressive. They, they more comfortable in the Green Party with our program, the majority of rank and file Democratic voters. But the power is with the corporations that provide the funding and the, uh, you know, have access to the media, they own the media, and, and sort of set the message. And if we, you know, try to work in that milieu, we get lost, we get marginalized, we lose our voice, we actually become, you know, trench workers for people that we're trying to, to oppose. Um, and then there are people that, you know, we can work with on issues. Dennis Kucinich, the peop most people in the Black Caucus and the Progressive Caucus on most issues would nominally agree with us. Um, the thing is, they have no power in that political structure, and they make the Democrats look better than they are. So when the Democratic Party is speaking to progressives, they say, look, we got Kucinich. You know, we got John Conyers. Uh, we had Cynthia McKinney. You know, made them look better than they were. And... Uh, the other thing they're doing, if you follow in the recent discussion, and this is very problematic, is they're very critical of the debt ceiling deal. That's the, the, the issue this week. Um, and then they get asked, well, Obama hasn't been helping you, has he? And they make excuses for Obama. It's like, well, no, it's the Republicans, it's the Republicans, it's the Republicans. Um, I think things are changing. If you saw, I sent this to the National Committee list. I don't know how many of you saw it. Trumpka had a blog last week about how the Republicans were imposing this bad debt ceiling deal. And then you read the comments and, you know, people in the labor movement are writing back, why are you letting the Democrats off the hook? We need a labor party. We need to support the Green Party. I mean, that was all the comments that I saw that first day. You know, th there's a stirrings there and, and people are beginning to see the futility of, uh, you know, relying on the Democratic Party. Uh, another version of this is the problem of fusion, which is permissible in seven or eight states. New York is where it's most practiced. And uh, we just went through an election where, I mean, this really takes the cake and shows you how that strategy of working, trying to be the progressive wing of the Democratic Party leads you to basically twisting yourself into a pretzel and supporting the opposite of what you want. The Working Families Party basically told the Democrats, whoever you nominate, we're going to put them on our ballot line. And they nominated Cuomo and they said, Mr. Cuomo, please take our ballot line. And Cuomo said, well, I don't know. You're under uh, investigation because they have this private firm that does field operations for candidates, gets paid, but their prices are lower than the market rate in New York City. So other Democrats were saying, oh, that's an illegal campaign contribution. And so there was an investigation. Meanwhile, the Independence Party, which is this sort of derives from the Perot movement party we have here where most of the leaders of it are you know, they're playing both sides against the middle to see what kind of patronage they can get. Uh, they offered Cuomo the line, and he took it right away, despite the fact that one of their leading people had taken a million dollars from Bloomberg and basically put it in his pocket instead of running a field operation. 
No problem for Cuomo, but it was a problem with the Working Families Party. And there were people in the party, and I think Cuomo was listening to them, like Hank Scheinkopf, you probably, is that how you pronounce the name? Scheinkopf, who, who's an operative in New York City. You've seen him on the cable news talk shows, probably CNN and so forth, um, saying maybe Working Families has outlived its usefulness. So, you know, the Working Families leadership is really nervous about this. So finally, at the last minute, they get their scandal cleared away. They, you know, the uh, investigation showed there was no illegal campaign contribution. So they go back to Cuomo, okay, we're clean. Take our ballot line. And Cuomo says, well, first you've got to sign off on this austerity budget. You know, Cuomo's doing what Walker did, but as a Democrat, you know, and it's more like that sugar-coated Satan sandwich that one of the congressmen was talking about, the debt ceiling being. You know, it's, it's not so much in your face as Walker, but it's the same direction opposite direction of what Working Families Party stands for, and they, they signed off. I mean, they basically lied. I mean, it was so funny that the leading right-wing think tank policy guy who's on our talk shows in New York, uh, E.J. McMahon, sent an open letter to Danny Canner, who heads the Working Families Party. He said, you know, basically, thanks, thanks for joining our side of the barricades. Let's do lunch. You know, and Danny didn't respond, but, you know. So, but Working Families says, well, and then he, after all that happens, they go to the voters and they say, vote for Cuomo on the working families line and send them a message. Now, they say the message is, that will tell Cuomo you support a progressive program. But I think the real message is, is we'll, you, know, you can take us for granted because we're going to vote for you no matter what you do. I think that's what working families sent. So our, our political independence is what gives us our power because then... The voters have an option, and the other politicians got to answer to the issues we're raising. We're not lobbying them to raise issues for us and do things for us in office. We're saying, you know, we got a better program, and then they got to answer what we put forward in the public forum, and it changes the whole nature of the debate. And that's where we get our power from. Now, having said that, I would say we don't want electoral coalitions with Democratic candidates. But on issue coalitions, we do want to work with, you know, rank and file Democrats and other progressives because that's how we approach people. If there's a common issue, we shouldn't be any litmus test as to what party you're in. And that's a place where we can build relationships, build trust, have people get to know us, and put forward issues that we're going to follow through in our election campaigns where the Democrats might not, or they will find excuses not to. And... Uh, so in saying we want political independence, that doesn't mean we don't work with even Democratic officials on particular issues where they're willing to stand up. We got a, uh, a bill to ban fracking in the state. There are no Greens in the legislature. So, you know, we support that bill and any, you know, we lobby Democrats and Republicans to sign on as co-sponsors. I mean, that's, that's fine. But when the election comes, we should put our own program out there. And if you know, they move to our position, which they do sometimes on, on some issues. That's fine, because that's our goal, to, to change the policies. Uh, last point I want to make on this is that when we say the Greens are independent, we're independent from the corporate parties. But I think we should be open to other independent progressive forces. Um, because we have done that in some states, we've built broader parties. The D.C. statehood party. You, know, you had the Green Party, you had the statehood party which is stronger in the black community, and they came together after a couple of election cycles because the Greens were open and the statehood was open to that kind of uh, coalition. And they became one party. They united uh, because they were open to that. And so they were forming not a popular front with the corporate liberals against the right wing, but with other independent progressive forces. Same thing with the Green Rainbow Party in Massachusetts. That same dynamic created a broader party than we would have had. Um, and as we go forward, there are situations that might come up. They won't come out of the Green Party. They'll come out of their own dynamic. The way demographics are changing, the Chicano Party in the Southwest could, like La Raza Unida did back in uh, the 70s, start electing people to Congress and have a block that could basically, or in a presidential election, get some electoral votes and, and become a block that could demand immigration reform. That might become a strategy they adopt, and that's something we could support, but they might do it on their own initiative, so we should relate to them. Uh, we've had initiatives, I mentioned some earlier, coming out of the black movement. You know, C.L.R. James, who was a Marxist and believed that, you know, you're going to have a working class revolution, but also said 
the left has to realize that blacks being very oppressed in this society may be the vanguard and when they move the whole working class moves and you need to respect their independent initiative so there could be black parties coming out of you know the black belt in the south or urban areas that we should relate to not say because they're not with us you know we can't work with them they're not with the corporate political structure so I think we need to be open to that same thing with labor or as we go into 2012, we got Green Parties in some states, but go to Vermont. You know, frankly, the Green Party in Vermont are some 911 truthers and one really obscure faction of that. Nobody in Vermont takes them seriously. There is a progressive party with a, uh, a, a senator they've helped elect at Sanders, but also state legislative people. They've controlled the city of Burlington, the biggest city since 1981. You know, the Green candidate, we may have a coalition candidate, and in Vermont they're on the progressive party. So I think we need to be open to those kinds of united fronts. But the, the bottom line message is that our political independence is where our power comes from. And that if we get into these coalitions inside the Democratic Party, we disappear, we lose our power, and we lose our very identity as an alternative and marginalize ourselves. So I think that's a self-defeating strategy. So issue coalitions with progressives who are in other parties, yes, but not electoral coalitions. That's where we draw the line and declare our independence. So with that, I've put out some ideas, and let's have a discussion. Well, my policy has been I accept contributions from individuals and people's organizations, democratic people's organizations, a labor union. Most of their structures are at least on paper democratic. In practice, that's not so true. So, you know, that's a compromise I'm willing to make because the membership can take control. Uh, there are environmental groups, community groups, peace groups that pool money together in PACs. I think we should accept that money, but not money from for-profit uh, companies or their trade associations and lobbyists. And I think that can be a, a financial base for our political independence because it's coming from the people. We're just pooling our money through our own organizations. I think that's acceptable. On safe states, I think in the Green Party now, it's not really, there's no, nobody really pushing it right now that I know of. Um, I think for most people, the 2004 experience, in fact, the Cobb campaign kind of backed away from south, safe states after the convention. Um, it, it, you know, it was a strategy, but as people thought more about it, it didn't make sense. Um, but it's, there's some of that there, and I think given the nature of our two-party system, winner-take-all, single-member districts, until we get proportional representation, you always have this lesser evil dynamic coming in, and it's going to come back in again and again and again. So we've got to keep talking about why we need to be politically independent. But I think for 2012, I'm not hearing it. I don't think it's going to be an issue this cycle. But don't be surprised if, you know, another cycle it does come back, and we'll have this discussion again, which, you know, comes to infighting. Look, I think infighting is good. It's a question of how you handle it. Because if you don't really talk about your issues, you're basically putting them underground, and instead of resolving them in open debate in a democratic decision, you got bureaucratic maneuvering. And that's when people really get upset. Um, and in terms of defeating the right, look, the progressive Democrats are accommodating the right. You know, Obama is doing what the right couldn't do. If they were doing it, the things that Obama's agreeing to right now, the Democrats would be out in the street. There was a study recently done, where's the peace movement? Well, Enrolled Democrats are not demonstrating with the rest of the peace movement now because there's a Democrat in power. So we got to talk to those people about how they need to stand for what they really stand for rather than for the Democratic Party because it's not delivering the results. Um, if you have a debate and infighting, that's good because it's going to clarify the issues. You make a decision. What we've got to realize is that, uh, to quote, I got this secondhand right wing quote from Margaret Hoover who's the great-granddaughter of Herbert Hoover, but she's talking about the Tea Party and the problems they're having in the Republican Party. She said, because we agree 80% of the time but not 20% of the time doesn't mean we're 20% enemies. You know, we got to work together where we agree, have solidarity, and agree to disagree on some things and keep debating them. I mean, we need to have that kind of political culture, but we got to talk about it. You know, the other slogan they could have put on that headline was, two greens, three opinions. You know, that's an old one in the Green Party, and, you know, that's all right. Yeah, we're not going to vote for that Democrat, but that Democrat knows that we're going to take our issues to the broader public. And they got to compete. The public may agree with us more than what that Democrat wants to do because they're getting campaign financing that's telling them to do another thing. So that's where our leverage comes because they know we're going to go to the public because we're independent. We're not going to support them electorally. 
What we're here to do is we're as citizens to say this is the right thing to do. And then they got to deal with that. I think that's where our power comes from. Um, the corporate media, there's, you know, Jello Biafra's answer to that question is don't whine about the media, be the media. And with the Internet, we have a lot of potential. We also have threats there, and this is a case where Obama has really not done what he said he would do. This is a broken promise, net neutrality. We're losing that with the uh, FCC decisions, which is going to, you know, uh, really diminish our ability to use the Internet. The other thing going on is they're now pushing through Patriot Act with, uh, as Senator Wyden from Congress says, you got the public uh, law on how they can screen our Internet messages and our phone messages and then privately how they're interpreting it. And basically the NSA is sweeping up everything we're saying and data mining so we don't have privacy. And, you know, that's scary as hell. So media policy and reform is a really important issue. I agree with you there. Um, but I think, you know, we need to be, think about being the media without dismissing the corporate media. I think if we had a credible presidential candidate, I think there's a dynamic developing between MSNBC, which are kind of the liberals of cable news, and now current. They got Oberman, they're about to get the Young Turk, and I think they're going to be competing for audience. And, you know, we got some compelling people speaking. We had Jason West uh, last week or the week before on the Rachel Maddow show. Um, we got a lot of, you know, I can't wait to see Sherry Honkala talking about foreclosures on one of those programs. So, uh, you said 99%, we got to take advantage of that 1%. Well, in small towns, if you have progressive Democrats want to get on the school board, I wouldn't be hostile to them, but I'd make them think. Say, we're going to run as green, we're not going to endorse you because you're part of a party that is cutting the school budget from Cuomo and Obama on down there, imposing testing. Make them think. Now, we know you got a good position. Personally, we're friendly, we'll work together on issues, but we're not going to endorse you because you're in a party that's opposed to what you stand for. Mm -hmm. and, and make them think and, you know, try to work on them. And then in local elections, you know, 200 kids, I mean, that school board, you're going to know everybody that's voting. You can personally approach them. The, the election will be about people, not so much party labels. But I think, you know, you want those people who are consciously Democrats running on that line to be thinking about what are they really doing in a party that's opposed to what they stand for. Um, the coalition progressive candidacy, um, as I mentioned, you know, if we go to Vermont, we're probably going to want the progressive party. If we go to South Carolina, the Labor Party and the Green Party both have lines, they're friendly. And so we want to run on both lines, it's a fusion state. Um, in uh, California, possibly, it, it, fusion is possible at the presidential level in California, so somebody could be on green and peace and freedom. I think we should be open to those kinds of things. And then there are states where we're not organized, where somebody else might be. And I don't know what those states are. I don't even think there are any, but there might be. Uh, the truth is, if we do a coalition, and there are you know, groups out there like the New Progressive Alliance that are talking about that, um, the Greens are going to be central to it because we got the most ballot lines, we got the most organization. So I don't think we should worry about, you know, getting swamped in some coalition. Actually, it should be seen as a recruiting opportunity for us. Um, the green identity will be strong, I think, in any coalition just because we got the battle lines. We've been at it. Um, and the idea of spokespeople in a shadow cabinet, I think, is very good. Um, I've long advocated that we separate administrative leadership from political leadership because, mm. you know, some people like to be behind the scenes doing that kind of work. They don't want to be out front. Other people are interested in the politics. And they're not responsible as administrators. I can speak from personal experience. <laughs> so say anything, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I knew you here. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying not to make the mistake. I've made worse mistakes in the future, in the past. Believe me. So I think that's a good idea.